open this place up. We invite you to do the teaching today. We invite you to lead this service, God. We invite you to heal any broken hearts. We invite you to lift up every bowed down head. We invite you, God, into the lives of your people in this place. Thank you, Lord. This is not our work. This is your work. This is not our life. This is your life. And we are mindful today of your very awesome presence in the name of Jesus. Have your way here. Speak clearly, God. Let let someone know, God, that I met you in that place. I met you there. Your life will never be the same. There is no recording in history where anyone met you in their life and remained the same. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. morning. My wife and I have uh, had the privilege of knowing Dr. James, his beautiful family, for years, as he said. And since that time, God has moved us and all around. And lately, we find ourselves at a lot of churches just by invitation. So when you called me, I was going, God. This is your work, but I realized that there is a timely message, and so forgive me because the message I thought I was going to bring, um, God corrected me last night and said, no, you'll speak on this. And I want you to be aware of something. I want you to be aware that this message will come across in the beginning as almost very depressing, almost negative, but hold on for a minute because help is on the way. But in our experience of traveling and being on board over at Phoenix First and being on the board of name, and my wife and I have been called by the Lord as of late to go travel to churches and to bring a message of awakening. Because sometimes when you're in your church, you have a very myopic vision of the body of Christ. And you're not aware of what's going on in the body globally. In other words, sometimes when you're in your family, you have to step outside of your family and realize that there are other things going on around us. And we find ourselves in that place, in a very peculiar place in history. And so, The first topic that I want to discuss with you is the church is not nearly as big as it's been made to be. The evangelical movement, I won't go into defining what evangelical is, but I consider us all part of evangelicalism, and so it's not nearly as large as what the evangelical movement of old had made it out to be, and lately the evangelicals have basically said, well, we will agree that our numbers are shrinking, and they are shrinking by an alarming rate. If you were to take all of the evangelical Christians throughout the United States, you could place all of them in, within the state of New York and not have another evangelical Christian in any of the remaining United States. So although we look big and we appear strong and mighty, that's not the truth. What is happening is the Bible says, think of yourself with sober judgment. Think of yourself with sober judgment. And so this is what's happening in the movement And our faith is, um, we fight amongst ourselves quite often. And when we fight amongst ourselves, we split and splinter and splatter. So what is happening in the body of Christ is many of the smaller to medium-sized churches are going away, dwindling down and closing the doors. 
And the reason why this does not seem like something that we notice is they're going down the street and joining the closest megachurch that they find. And because it is broadcast, the mega churches, you all know what I'm talking about, the churches that boast that we've got 10,000, boast that we've got 12,000, the ones that we see on TV, we have a sense that all is well. But what is happening ultimately is we are just simply moving around Christians from place to place and not ministering to the folk that God called us to. And unless we know what is happening, we won't see the solution. So years ago, there was, a, there was a recession that came upon the United States, and it didn't come without warning. Most of us simply weren't listening. Those who began to warn that now is not the time to buy that boat, now is not the time to mortgage a house, we didn't want to listen to that. Because why? If Johnny has a boat next door, even though he could not afford it. They tell me my house is worth triple the value as well. So I've been wanting that boat, and I'm going to go get it. Not minding the cost, nor the season, nor what God was saying. And when we ignore prophetic warning, there's a price to pay. The reason I believe that God is sending us not just us, but has touched my heart with this message is God does not want us found in a desolate, dry, deserted place. Say help is on the way. So the first part of this, again, just stay with me for a little bit because it gets better. But this is just what we're finding everywhere we go. The fuel of American evangelistic dollars is disappearing. And those dollars will continue to dwindle over the next three decades. Everything I'm going to tell you, there, is, there are statistics and there's research behind all of this. And I just thank the Lord for giving us good information. Because it's, it's hard to make amends or to do better unless someone says to you, this is what the true information is, right? So why is the fuel of American dollars dry, drying up? One factor is the old saints that we used to depend on are getting older. The ones who were the backbone of our ministries are no longer with us. Most churches are very young. There are a lot of young people in them. And we have not noticed that those who have plowed the way for us and laid the foundations are no longer there. When they are no longer there, I'll give it to you this way. My wife and I are noticing, as of late, that the older we get, the older our parents are getting. <laughs> What's scary about that is you begin to realize mom and dad won't be here always. And when I began to look and see in my own family how my grandmother is now suffering from dementia, my mother has now been diagnosed with some things. It puts a burden upon me. I used to be just the free-flowing son who just came in and got money and cards and just did what I want to, but now God has placed me in a place of responsibility. So now when I visit my parents, I realize I got a responsibility here because mother can't carry the things that she used to carry. So here is something else that you should know. We are losing about 2.6 million people per decade, just from one generation studied. The evangelical church is not winning new believers fast enough to keep pace with the rapid population growth in the United States. While these forces eat at the church internally, external, the external climate is turning against us in a hostile, almost antagonistic way. What's left of a smaller, shrinking, strapped church is also splintering itself over politics and postmodern views of God and the Bible. All of these things have been the plan of the devil for years. 
And the devil will sit back with the plan and let us go about playing church and doing church until we open our eyes one day and say, what happened to the church? And so with this movement, what we find now is that the world is very different. And the way communication travels, what used to take a year or six months to get out can be across the United States in almost 20 minutes or less. And so when I was coming up, my folks had a way of knowing what was happening in the community because they kind of had feelers and people in the community. You know what I'm talking about. Anybody know that when your mother gave you an instruction to do something, even if she wasn't around, someone else was carrying out that instruction. Aren't you supposed to be at home? <laughs> you look around and say, but my mother is not here. Right? So we had a way of controlling what was around us. Well, now the host culture is no longer being affected as much by the church as much as the host culture is bringing its effect upon the church. We are no longer counting disciples, we're counting dollars in the church. Most ministers are not even aware that what they have given up is the call of God for buildings and folk and mega ministries. And so what is happening is what we see in the world has now come inside the church and it is affecting us in ways that we don't even understand. What my son deals with at school, I didn't deal with. When my son comes home and he says, Dad, Johnny says he's got two fathers. And I say, let's have that conversation. What I realize is God is saying you cannot ignore any longer the obvious because this culture is surrounding him. So I had to come up with a different methodology. Now, instead of dropping my kid off to school, I get out and walk him into his class. Why? Because God is calling me to experience what he's experiencing in order that I might be able to minister to him, but I can no longer send him off and just give him a word and believe that the word that I give him is enough to sustain. God said that used to be the case, but he's dealing with the whole culture that is stripping him of everything that you've invested. It's time for you to change your position. So whatever he walks through, I have to walk through. Why? Because I've got to be relevant to his life. I must be relevant. I hear Christians all over the world saying, I don't do that, and I don't listen to rap music, and I don't go here, and I'm saying we've got to change some of our traditional values because they're listening to it, and if you're not able to have a conversation with the world, what good are you? They may not necessarily want to hear about Jesus, but you first must want to hear from them. When folk from the street come into our churches nowadays, most folk in the church look at them as if they don't belong. Why? Because we've become a culture unto ourselves. We protect ourselves, we look after ourselves, and the world can't get in. We'd rather have them away and have ourselves on the inside. But there was a man named Jesus. who didn't seem as concerned about sanctuaries Amen. and meetings Amen. and missionary circles and theology as much as he was concerned about meeting your need. Amen. And what carried people from one place in the faith to another faith was, I met this man who seemed completely and honestly concerned about me. As a matter of fact, there was a woman at a well who had a conversation with Jesus. And what she found out is Jesus knew more about her men than she did. That invoked a deeper conversation. Where is the conversation today in the church? With the outsider. At my church, I realize I spend most of my time counseling and stewarding folk who say they're saved. In most churches, we spend most of our time counseling and encouraging folk who say they've had a conversion experience. 
And God said, if you're spending that much time with folk who say they're saved, how much time could you possibly be spending with the lost? Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you're spending all of your time at church, how could you possibly be effective in doing what I ultimately called you to do? And here is the point of this message. Most of us, me included, have lost sight of what God called us to do. And there lies the plight of the American church. I only want to be in service 50 minutes because the Cardinals play 12. Make sure that you have me out of here by this time. We don't even recognize that the world is controlling us. The way we behave, what we talk about. Why is it that we come to church and most of what we talk about at church? I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about at my church. Why is it that most of what I'm talking about with the brothers and the sisters at my church has nothing to do with God? And everything to do with the world. And then we come in and we sing six songs. Pastor preaches, we raise, up, raise, our hand, raise our hands, and then we go home. But have our lives been changed? I was teaching this message. I can't get through all of this because this is a series, so I'm just trying to give you the highlights. Uh, a few weeks ago, and it took me two or three weeks to get through it, and a sister at my church called me, and she said, Oh, my God, oh, my God, you have to go listen to, to this message um, and, and this message, this pastor was preaching almost the same thing that I was teaching here down in the South. And as he was teaching this message, the title of it was, Would Somebody Go Get Leroy? <laughs> and in the part of the message that was really, really for me is one wife who always came to church with her husband, who was a deacon and very active, stopped coming. And the pastor said, where is your wife? And, and, and the brother said, she said she's not coming to church. And he said, you mean today? And he said, no, she said she's not coming back. He said, what do you mean? He said, my wife said, she's done. So the pastor called her up and said, well, what's wrong? And she said, listen, I cannot come to a church any longer to hear about how good God is and how God saves to the utmost and how God delivers and sets free. And my own son is around the corner at a crack house and my own husband, who's a deacon at that church, does not have enough God in him to go around the corner to get him. What is his name? His name is Leroy. Mm -hmm. so the pastor got up and said, would somebody go get Leroy? If we speak about something that we're not doing, what effect is it? Amen. Weeks passed by, weeks passed by, and she wasn't there. And then one Sunday, he looked up and she was praising and she was dancing and she was raising her hands. And he couldn't believe how joyous he was. she was until he looked next to her and he saw Leroy. So I ask you today, you see this seat here? Somebody's dying because they're not sitting here. Somebody's on crack because they're not sitting right here. Somebody is on their way to hell because these seats are not filled. And until my heart gets disturbed by that, in other words, would somebody in the church go get Leroy? There's a pastor in this city. He stood up a few, I think it was last Christmas, and he said, there's somebody that I know that's suffering and they're hurting and, and the person is giving and giving and giving. And, 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 and I just need to tell you all that the person needs help and the people in the church were wondering, is it somebody that we know? And he went on to tell the story about if the person isn't given some help soon, they're going to die. And he went on to explain that the person that he was talking about was the church. It's a church here in our city that boasts about 12,000 people that was dying on the vine. Why? Because we're serving ourselves. If my law firm does not go get new clients, and all we do is trade the same clients around, they eventually stop paying, and we stop eating. That same model is true for the church. We can no longer be satisfied 
with a praise and worship song in an uplifted spirit just for me. The Bible says Jesus took a few and he poured into those few and he walked with those few day by day and we see examples of them slipping and sliding and Peter said, I will love you always. I will never ever deny you. Peter wasn't mature enough but he was on his way. Why was God walking with Peter like that? Because he knew one day Peter would stand up and be the man of God that he had called Peter to do. But why did God show us that trajectory and that path is we don't become what we shall be unless someone in the faith walks us through it. I was raised in the church, and what I realized is my church was good at getting folks saved, but not very good in walking people through a transformed life. There is a difference in coming to God and having your life and your thinking transformed and renewed. Why do we do good with salvation? Because we make an invitation and we give you to God. Why do we do, do not so good with discipleship? Because it's never been taught to most of us. And if there is an area in most of our churches that we're failing at, again, I'm not speaking directly to you, I'm talking about it globally, what's affecting the church is we have forgotten the most important thing. And what did Jesus tell all of us? Did he say, go to the church, lift up your hands and pray? Yeah. But why do we come here? Because we love him. Why am I not at my church this morning? Because my first commandment is this. Go ye into all the world. Yes. And to make disciples. Now, making disciples is not something that can be done from a pulpit message on Sunday. Making disciples means I've got to get your number. We got to go to lunch. And we got to talk. And we got to meet. And we got to talk about the hard things and the great things. And we've got to learn what it looks like to walk and to think and to be like Jesus. And I'm so thankful that there were some brothers in my life in Oklahoma that walked me through faithfulness. I'd be off in college at the University of Oklahoma and I'd say, I don't think I'm coming home this weekend. And one of my brothers would say, oh, yeah, you are. If you're not here, we're coming to get you. And every Friday night, I would drive almost two hours to be in a Bible study with them. And what they were doing was they were making me a disciple. Thankfully, today, all of us are still in the ministry. But if they had not walked me through, if someone had not grabbed me by my hand and said, no, you will not pledge Q. Well, they pledge in Q. I am pledging. If you pledge, we will be up there tomorrow. And they meant every word that they said. I am thankful today that they walked me through when I was struggling with how to pray and how to receive the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Another one that would say, come on home this weekend and we will just take a walk in the park. Lift up your hands. And I'd say right here, he'd say right here in the middle of the park because God is everywhere that you are. Lift up your hands. And I'd be walking in the park, lifting up my hands. And he'd say, now pray what comes into your spirit. And I'd say, what spirit? He said, it will come. Just walk with me. In the park, yes, and it works also in the mall, and it works also at the hospital, and it works also here, and it works also there. We were in the hospital praying for a brother and pleading for God to lift him up from his deathbed, and he died. And I called one of these brothers. This was a few years ago. I called him in Atlanta, and I said, man, I was believing God, along with some of the other brothers at the church. And I was believing God that God would raise this brother up. You know we've seen God raise people up from the dead. And he let me finish whining and talking. He said, are you done? And I said, yes. He said, did the brother die? I said, yes. He said, well, I had that happen to me just a few weeks ago. But guess what? I said, what? He said, when the next opportunity presents itself, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. He said, you're going to believe God again. Why? Because that's what we've been called to do. The ultimate decision about raising him up was God's. But if you had not been in that place, what would have happened to the other brothers that did not believe? What would have happened to the doctor who said, by what power do you walk in here? What would have happened to the nurses that said, can I get a card? We believe in a God that is able to do the impossible. But what happens when the church is no longer there? 
And I'm thankful that I still have them walking with me. So when we look at what is happening, there was a statistic that said we used to believe that our children who fell away from the church would come back to the church because we believed the scripture. But what we did not account for is this new postmodern generation where homosexuality and sexuality and all of these other things now have the minds of our kids wondering. And when you don't understand the whole culture, you don't understand what they're battling against. And so here are the statistics. The statistics say that one third or better will never come back. And if they're not coming back, what should the church be doing? Going to get them. So if God has called us to make disciples, how many of us have become students of the Lord? Do you know what it means to be a student of the Lord? We know that the Bible tells us about a man named Paul who on the Damascus Road had an experience with God. But watch this. The experience with God wasn't enough because God also sent a man by the name of Ananias who said, I don't want to have anything to do with him because I know of his reputation. And God says, Ananias, this is the hard part. It's called making disciples. You go to him and you instruct and you help him and you assist him. All we see is the great work of Paul, but very few talk about the work of Ananias. What if Ananias had not gone to mentor Paul when God told him to? Paul would have had the power of God, but not the instruction. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? So how do we do this? I was telling my wife the other day when I was teaching this message about the third or fourth week, I said, now we're at a crossroads because the question is how? And my wife says, oh, I got the answer. The church doesn't want to hear it. I'm not talking about your church because I don't know y'all. I'm talking about the church globally. You know how we do it, my brother? We don't do it by having a mass auditorium full of 20,000 people. Don't no one know if those people are saved. You know why those people are at those big churches? Not all of them. They can be invisible. You know why people go to big churches? There's no accountability. Why would you go to a church and not even be able to get in the church? You're in a satellite room talking about you went to the potter's house. I was at the potter's house on Sunday. You were? I wasn't really in the real church. I was in the side view church looking at the message on the screen. But what if you needed to get to the potter? Yes. But no, we can't get to him. We have to go through all of it. Somebody has to be able to get to the potter. Anybody understand what I'm saying? Yes. And so what has happened is we've taken a movement and made it synonymous with the church movement. Because we tend to like big stadium and big events, when a church looks like what we think it should look like, big and loud and beautiful, we think that we are saving and doing the great commission that God has called us to. That's how the world has shaped our thinking. In other words, if you're not driving a S550 Mercedes, you didn't make it. Well, the truth of the matter is, you could be driving a Hyundai that's 1942 with two busted pipes and three bald tires and be worth more than this guy that looks like he's worth something. But we look at the person that's got the shiny stuff and we say, boy, I tell you what, he's successful. Where did we get that from? The world. I only bring this to your attention that we might begin to redesign and reevaluate what have we been called to do. So back to my point, and Pastor, I'm almost done. How do we do this? We do it one conversation. Somebody just said it. At a time. Not mass meetings. Not putting more on the pastor than he can do. All he can do is what God called him to do, and that is preach and teach the word. But at some point, somebody else who's got the revelation that received what God had for them has got to take that brother or sister by the hand and say, now let me tell you how to walk this out. Because most of us that have walked by faith find, have found out that walking it out isn't nearly as easy 
as receiving it from the pulpit. You, does anybody know what I'm saying? Jesus himself found out that carrying out the Great Commission was not nearly as easy. He was God but all men, and he gave us glimpses of what it looked like to walk it out. Father, if it be thy will, I would that this bitter cup would pass from me. This hurts a lot more, God. And then you hear and see the process of transformation taking place in his own language. He says, but nevertheless, yeah. mm, as difficult as this is, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. In other words, God and Jesus were having a conversation that we couldn't hear. Jesus, this is what I called you to do. You need it to go. Because if you don't go, they don't come. If you don't die, they die forever. Mm -hmm. So remember in the beginning when we decided that you would go? Jesus said, nevertheless. Yeah. So what I found out in this Christian walk is someone sometimes, no matter how powerful, no matter how great, no matter how strong I look, I have nevertheless moments yes. where yes. some brother or sister has to grab my hand and say, don't quit now. You've come too far by faith. God has never, I know we've had a few bumps in the road, but so did Jesus. And this is what the process looks like. Yes. <laughs> That's the power of the gospel. And unless we go get the unsaved and bring them in, the church will continue to die. And God will continue to allow it to die because he did not intend for us to grow fat Amen. and lazy Amen. just because we've been fed. Amen. What I had to recognize and realize is I had to get out of my suit, put on my tennis shoes, go kind of listen to what my neighbors were talking about and find enough strength in God to walk down the street and say, I'd like to join y'all's conversation. You mean to tell me you're joining a conversation in your neighborhood rather than going to your church? Yeah. How is it that I can drive by so many unsaved folk on Sunday morning on my way to worship a God who is able, according to my testimony, to save the unsaved? But why am I driving past them? To go worship? But after a while, my worship to lead, should lead me back to the place where God found me, because that place should never become unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. In other words, I should be on the scent of the unsaved. Yes. Why? Yes. Because that's what God called yes. me to. Yes. Anybody hearing me? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. And then that becomes the new fuel of the church. We won't have room enough in here to seat them when we become mature enough to go out and say, Pastor, we got a whole new flock coming in. So somebody else can have my seat. I called a brother last night on my way over here and I said, I need somebody else to take my seat. What if I'm not prepared? Now is your time to learn. The longer I'm there, the weaker you become. You will never read and study it for yourself as long as you're looking for Minister Wooten to do it for you. So guess what? Tomorrow is your time. I'll get the report and I'll help you when I get back. But tomorrow, I'm in Scottsdale. And then next week, I'm over here. And next week, I'm over here. I'll be back in about a month. And if you got to see, we'll work your way up to getting an A. But that's what God has called. Somebody needs to go get Leroy. What you're doing here is a great work. Beautiful songs, lifting up the Lord. And don't get me wrong. We all come in here to get encouraged and refueled. But don't think that God has called you to this place as your resting place. This is not where God called you. He called you to save you and to equip you and to put you out there in the midst of a host culture that wants nothing to do with us. Peter was so, Stephen was so bold that when they went to stone him, Peter, Stephen said, hold on a second. I just got a little preaching to do. And I keep reading my, flipping my pages. He just preached on until they said, just hold on a minute. This is what I've been called to do. This is what we have been called to do. If the world would have their way, they would, and we're headed that way, 
where Christians all over the United States, they're not talking much about it, they're doing it quietly, they're persecuting us and quieting us. Even ministers are being sued and being told what they can preach and what they cannot preach. You cannot no longer declare this, y'all can't do this. People that are out in the community lifting up the, 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 the Lord and evangelizing are being arrested in certain communities. But you mean to tell me that every other pro-sexual, secular person can do and say whatever they want? How is it that we can no longer pray in the schools, but we can do everything else? Amen. How is that? And will somebody stand up and say, I got to pray? Because that's what I've been called to do. That's right. That's right. There was a minister who, and I'll take my seat, had told his children, that y'all be inside here when I get home because this is my duty. And when he turned the corner, he saw his children not where he told them to be, and they started running to get home. Because the people in the neighborhood heard the children screaming, they called the police. Man hadn't done anything, but got out of his car, looked down the street, and they started running and screaming. So when the police got to the front door, they knocked on the door and said, sir, we got a call that there may be a child neglect, child abuse situation. He said, no, you came too early. It hadn't happened yet. <laughs> they said, well, sir, we would like to talk to you. He said, listen. My children and my family must be saved. And as a man of God, I got to keep my word. I am doing what God has called me to do. Y'all don't want to come out here if I do my job. And all I asked my children were to be in a safe place because all I'm trying to do is make a living and take care of them. And so I need to talk to my children because that's my responsibility, not yours. Now, if you want to take me to jail for doing what God has called me to do, isn't, isn't that what you've been called to do, sir? Is to protect and to serve? They said, yes. He said, well, I've been called to do that in my house first. He said, but I'll tell you what. Let me go in and do what God called me to do, and y'all stand right here on this porch. And when I get back, y'all can take me wherever y'all want to go. And he shut the door. He went in there, and he took care of what he needed to do in terms of correcting his kids. And he came back, and he looked at the officers, and he said, I'm ready to go. And the officers both start laughing. And they said, man, if there were only more people like you. See, we've been called to a world that will recognize us when we stand up Amen. to do what God has called us yes. to do. The officers walked off his doorstep and said, have a nice day. And he said, thank you. We've been called to a world to make disciples. Now listen. When they come in and they don't know how to act, God will take care of that. Because some of us didn't know how to act either when we first got here. So in my closing, what's the measure of a healthy church? Is it the number of vans and the number of seats? How big and glorious the institution looks like? How do we measure whether or not our body is healthy? What's the only measure that God gave us? New disciples. Yes. That's it. That's what God has called us to. This pastor that wrote a book that really started this study said that when God took him into this place, he had 40 people. When he saw the rest of what was happening in the body of Christ, he had 40 people. And God said, before you get a worship leader, before you get a Bible school teacher, before you get a secretary, I want you to go find a skilled person to lead your church into evangelism. He said, what? He said, I want you to go get someone skilled in evangelism. So they went, found this person, and they took out to the streets. We just want to show the love of God to you, my brother. They took over neighborhoods. They took over the next neighborhood. The church went from 40 to 800. It's in Prescott, and they don't have enough room. Now guess what? They can afford a van. They can afford a worship leader. They got ministers all on staff. They've got funds coming in, and now they're dealing with the problems that come with being big because they got the commission right first. 
So I encourage you today, let's return back to the place that God called us to. On your way to church, bring somebody. And if they won't go to church, go to them. Have a cup of coffee. And sooner or later, even if they don't want to know about Jesus, they want to know about you. How can you remain so positive? How can you be so strong? How are you and your ma wife still married? That's what folk want to know today. You still married to the same woman, yeah? Now when people start that conversation, I say, okay God, I see what you're doing here. This is testimony time. Because people are not used to that. Your children are still going to church, yeah. Your business is still prospering, yeah. Mine is not, can we talk about that? I'll go to lunch with you next week. And ultimately, God finds his way into their hearts because they had a conversation one at a time. And then I send that brother off to somebody else that can carry him, and then I go back and start the conversation all over again. I hope that's helped somebody. Amen. Amen, Pastor.